All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another community conversation. Uh, this is something that was born at Stanford University and a course that we're doing called Community College. And we're really excited to have a bunch of special guests in the house with us today. Uh, we'll get to intros in a couple minutes, but let me uh, set a foundation for kind of where you are and what we're up to for today. Uh, in community college, we are taking those two words and attempting to take back some of the narrative around them. Uh, you might have heard community college uh, referred to as a stepping stone maybe to a four-year university or uh, told somebody about your aspirations to go big and they prescribed you community college as a way to temper a goal, a big goal that you've had. So what we're doing in this uh, series of community conversations is taking community college and um, really embracing what community means to a lot of black and brown and underrepresented voices. Um, community means a lot. Uh, and the college part of it is the educational aspect that a lot of our parents and grandparents and great grandparents uh, prescribe for us so that what we do in our generation can be better than what they were able to experience in the past. So taking those two concepts of community college, putting them together and seeing if we can uh, remix it just a bit. So with that, I'll move forward one slide and set a couple of norms for this space that we've made here. I just wanna say that if you feel comfortable just listening and not speaking up, not jumping into the chat, that's totally fine. If you want to you know, actively raise your hand, uh, come off mute towards the end, uh, the com community forum that we're gonna have, feel free to show up in that way as well. Um, the ground rules here are just like respectful kind of communication, uh, honest and open, uh, transparent is what we're trying to establish here. So feel free again to show up as you wish and uh, really, really appreciate all of the folks who decided to come out and spend some time with us today. All right, so with that, welcome to Community College with the tagline of Designing World Peace. Uh, the Peace is an acronym for policy, uh, the environment, AI and ML technology, culture and ethics. So we'll talk about uh, accessibility today, AI and ML today, and then also uh, a bit about inclusion. So those definitely align to those five pillars of peace that we're emphasizing uh, this, this semester. Uh, the question that we asked ourselves as we endeavor to do this work is how do we make space for black and brown genius expertise and creativity? So uh, you'll see centered in the conversation today um, myself and, and Jeff will ask some questions to, to Heather and to Jamal, uh, but we really wanted to make some space for subject matter experts to uh, share with our community what they've learned, what they're excited about, and to help us be able to dialogue with each other so that we can all learn and grow together. All right, so with that, this is the uh, Stanford team that over the last 18 months has built up what has now become Community College. Uh, I'm Brandon on the upper left. We've got Ariam on the top middle, Pia on the top right, uh, Adrian bottom left, um, Nari bottom middle, and then Marvell on the bottom right. And just want to say on behalf of all of them who are not present, it's very nice to meet you. So with that, before we get into official introductions um, of our special guests, uh, feel free if you just joined us to throw your city, your state, your planet into the, the chat to tell us where you're logging in from. And with this, I want to um, take it over to my web browser and our special guest, Heather, is going to uh, help us with our activity and talk about some of the accessibility choices that a couple of websites uh, could make to improve the experience for folks that are going to come to them. So. Heather, I'm going to uh, shift over to my web browser and uh, show off a new site and then Costco.com and to set and to ground ourselves in what good access, uh, accessibility looks like. We're going to have a little bit of a fun activity before we kick off our Q&A. So you ready for it, Heather? I am, thank you so much. I actually think if we could, let's all navigate to our web browsers and actually go to the CBS Miami website first, really quickly. I'm gonna drop it in the chat as well. Let's chat to everyone. 
So I just dropped the URL in the chat. Brandon is showing the web, he's opened up his, his Chrome browser and has already gone to the website. And so if you've joined us on the web and you're at the website, go ahead and click in the address bar where the URL is just to orient yourself. And then from there, I want you to just continue to hit the tab button to navigate. Don't navigate the website using your mouse or anything else, just the tab button and continue to click through the site. There are some folks uh, with disabilities who navigate the web using keyboard only, so not using their mouse um, and being able to navigate a website using the tab key is very important. But I have to ask you, do if you're following along, on your own, or if you're looking at Brandon's web page, do you know where you are now that you've pressed the tab button a few times? Could you actually navigate this site only using the tab key? Almost impossible. Uh, uh, even on Brandon's screen, like in the bottom left corner, there's really small text of like what tab you're highlighting, but there's no <laughs> signal. There's nothing to signify it on the web page, and that text is extremely small for a guy that has in contact, and I still can't see it. Right. Brandon, if you could scroll down just a little bit, I mean, look at what's all on the page to try to orient yourself. Like, where would you go? We saw the weather. There's a little a bulleted list of most viewed, you know, so layout and headings are very important when navigating the website or web page efficiently as well. Right now, you all, like me, might be navigating and scanning the page using your eyes, but a lot of people, particularly folks who are blind or low vision, might use assistive technology, a screen reader that would actually, and they would actually have to orient how this page was laid out in the most efficient way to come in here and get the information they need. Can you imagine how many hours it might take to find if you were looking for something particular here? So I just want you all to think about that. Now let's log into the Costco website. And that should be, um, yeah, Costco.com, but I'll put it in the chat as well. And go ahead again and orient yourself in the address bar um, with the URL. And from there, start to hit the tab key. Ah, there's a skip to main content link that comes up that allows you to kind of cut the noise on the page and get straight to it. If you could continue to hit the tab key. Oh, we're on to the next actionable thing on the page, a link about the COVID message. And as you can see, the actual text is highlighted with a focus indicator, which apparently looks yellow from my screen around the black text. If you could continue. And now you can actually follow along where you're tabbing. So really quickly, just wanted to give you all a flavor. This is, there's so many different exercises that we could do, but this is important. When you think about COVID and the pandemic, everything is online. You ordered your groceries online for a particular point of information. You went online to figure out just COVID stats in your area. Yet for a couple years, over 97% of the world's top 1 million websites were inaccessible for people with disabilities, 97%. So think about that in the context of today's conversation. I'm learning stuff already. So I'm gonna stop my share here and go back to the presentation. But hopefully, you know, folks in the, in the chat can see uh, the types of considerations that need to be made to truly be inclusive of everyone who's going to be um, taking part in, in, in this economy, in this technology age that we're moving into. So I'm going to share the presentation once more. And in the chat, if you would, uh, we're going to do a couple of quick activities 
So I'm going to move very quickly, stop for maybe 30 to 60 seconds, and I want you all to respond in the chat, uh, whether you feel option A or option B is like the better design choice to make what I'm going to show you uh, more accessible. So here we go. Let's start with this first one here. So if you see on the screen here, we've got a first name, last name, email, and password um, image, something that you would use to sign into an email account or to sign up for an email account. In the chat, and I can't see it, so Jeff and Pia, you all can uh, help me out here, but what would make something like this uh, inaccessible? I'll let you all think about it for about 30 seconds or so. And then I'll I'll give the give the answer, give the reveal. Any interesting comments coming into the chat, you all? We got a few things coming into the chat here. Catherine Lewis says placeholder text goes away. There are no labels once you start typing in there, maybe. We got Shanta saying there's a color contrast potentially is an issue. Mm -hmm. Motun says the color of the text in the sign up box is maybe that's a similar sort of thing, contrast. Yep. Um, Jan says uh, maybe there's an implication that this is either or. You can sign up or you can sign up this way or you can sign up to Google. That might be confusing to some people. Uh, yeah. Same color from Sydney. Uh, thin fonts, hard to see for low vision people. Uh, no form header, no title for this page. All great, thanks so far. Yeah, beautiful observations and thank you for, for playing along. Uh, I'll move forward one slide and let's see if I can. Yes, so the low contrast is the top like offender um, from our perspective in terms of uh, folks who might not be able to see low contrast. So there's actually a, a, a standard that is out there um, so picking something that was darker or more contrasting than that light gray is something that would be uh, very much appreciated for someone who uh, might have low vision or is blind um, or, you know, visually impaired, like, like Heather had talked about. So uh, all great, great comments and points. Uh, I'll leave it to, to Jeff and to Heather and to Jamal before I go to the next one. Any additional things to call out besides the low contrast that might be a best practice from an accessibility standpoint? I'll just add because I like talking about this stuff really quickly. Um, I love how someone just talked about how the or wasn't clear, like clear language, plain language is very important. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. Another thing with forms is, can you imagine if this was a really long form um, and you weren't able to really understand like what the error handling was? Uh, sometimes you've ever gotten a form that says, oh, you can't submit, but it's not clear what form or field is missing. All of these things are things that we can make clear um, with forms. And this is a, a huge repeat offender. <laughs> Another thing that I, uh, Sarah Quick had, had put in the chat that I think is worth highlighting is um, yeah, we've got uh, somebody who's saying they're having trouble reading this without their reading classes. I can't, so I can't imagine being visually impaired and trying to read it. Uh, to me, this kind of touches on on something that I like to talk a lot about with uh, with the people that I consult with in, in my role, um, but that uh, disability is a, a spectrum, and a lot of times what you think of as disability uh, is a much narrower definition than what you might think of it as. Um, if I have trouble reading something when I have my glasses off, that means I have a vision impairment, and I'm using my glasses as an assistive technology to help me overcome that or uh, or adapt to that disability. Um, so uh, Sarah, you might be disabled in that definition and that's fine. Um, and, uh, and you're kind of calling out that uh, you're experiencing the effect of this uh, design decision that's kind of Im imposed that disability on you. Yeah, beautiful. Well, let's, uh, let's play one or two more of these. Um, so go back into the chat and a different thing, you know, we see the do this on the top in terms of the the text field uh, with the red exclamation point 
inside of it. And then we see the don't do this with the text field that just has kind of free form text input. Why do you think we're recommending the top design uh, and not the bottom design? I'll, I'll give you 30 seconds or so to throw some commentary into the chat about why the top text field design is better than the bottom. Catherine is uh, observing that the bottom one is relying on color alone. Any other observations? Yeah, so we've got uh, Sydney calling out that uh, the top one has an icon in a description, uh, maybe making it easier to identify that error and describing what the issue uh, of the error is. Uh, Sarah notes that uh, she's better able to identify that I, she needs to check something with the exclamation mark. Uh, got some more comments on the icon. Um, yeah, great observations. Yep, that's perfect. The the answer, you know, quote unquote, that I had was that you know form fields. The issue is that using red to indicate information such as success or failure, uh, with no other way to indicate um, success is potentially an issue. I think the description of issue underneath the actual subtext gives you more context in terms of what uh, is expected. Um, the fact that this is reactive, so you've probably put text inside of text fields where as you enter it, it'll tell you this password is red and weak. Maybe this password is yellow and like medium, and this password is green because it checks all the boxes on what we expect. Um, the don't do this on the bottom lacks much of that. And what's on the top, that design has a little bit more uh, information to allow somebody to access it in, in a way that's inclusive. So uh, that's, that's that example. I'll pause again, uh, Heather and Jamal or Jeff, if you had anything extra to put on this one. I think that, that second thing that you said is um, is worth uh, maybe emphasizing here. Heather, in the last example, called out the how the or could be confusing and the importance of plain language. Um, that maybe touches on like cognitive impairments and how uh, people sometimes need uh, need things to really be clear about what's going on. Um, so the the symbol to be able to identify where the error is that's great. Um, and not relying on, on the ability to perceive hue. Um, but then beyond that, being able to know what the issue is, is really important. And spelling that out in as plain of language as possible is, is critical. Perfect, so I appreciate everybody for playing along. This is the last one that I've got uh, before we jump into the next segment, which is Q&A. So uh, fancy me, which of the two designs is better designed and why? Go ahead and take 30 seconds to give some reasons about the top one versus the bottom one and which which one you think is better. Uh, just to be clear, the top one says click here and the here is linked to read about our company. And then the bottom one says to learn more about our company, read about us and the about us is linked. So go ahead and take 30 seconds for that one and see what you come up with. Jeff, feel free to mm -hmm. be my assistive technology as I can't see the, the chat. Feel free. Anything, yeah. anything is coming in. For sure. So we've got uh, Catherine pointing out the top makes it clear where to click and it's a clickable link. Mm -hmm. um, Jan points out the top is plain language um, and uh, not all people might know that about us is a hyperlink perhaps. And um, Shanta points out the top line is more direct and clear uh, it's obviously there's a link to click. Um, and is that Logan, I think? The top one disrupts the user's eye by providing a link before they even finish reading the sentence. Mm -hmm. Top is concise, is direct, concise and direct from Sydney. Um, yeah, interesting comment. Sarah agrees with the concise and direct, I suppose. Or, oh, perhaps the disruption from Logan comment. It sounds like 50 50 to me so like half the group is, is like on one side and then half the communities on the other side so uh, i'll read out the the thing that we wrote down for this third one and i'll fast forward oops one slide and point out 
that the hyperlink issue, uh, the click here, it could have been more descriptive um, and it could have been placed like towards the end in order to make it easier for like a screen reader to tell what the link is for. So just here versus like about us, I think would help a screen reader uh, dictate to somebody who was using one, like uh, a little bit more context. So that was like one uh, plus for the bottom design. Uh, I've got a note to say the screen readers, you know, Heather went over it, but again, their software that blind or visually impaired people will use in order to uh, read text that is displayed on a computer screen um, with a speech synthesizer or a braille display. So for those couple of reasons and some that were pointed out, uh, our vote, you know, mine and Pia's were, was the bottom design. Uh, but let me like kick it back to Heather. Like, do, do you agree with the bottom or do you have uh, uh, thoughts about that verdict versus the other one? I agree with the bottom and I'll tell you why, because it's all about context. So if you think back to that CBS page or even Costco, if you have a whole bunch of click here, click here, click here, mm -hmm. and imagine your eyes being closed and listening to the audio of a screen reader, that can be disorienting. And so whenever we're able to differentiate between the links with a more descriptive language, the better. And so I think this one was just tricky because we all probably had our eyes open looking at it. <laughs> got it, got it. Well, cool. Um, thanks everyone for playing along and thanks Jeff for, for helping me to uh, navigate the chats and the comments that I can't see. Uh, so I'll fast forward one slide and we will first do introductions and then we will jump into some cool Q&A. And again, for everybody in the community, feel free to, as we go through the Q&A, to load up your own questions uh, so that we can get to them as well throughout the course of the conversation. So um, I introduce myself uh, maybe my co-moderator, Jeff, can uh, introduce himself as well. Then we'll go to, uh, to Heather and Jamal. All right, Jeff, you can go ahead. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> I was not sure if you were going to go first. Um, awesome. Well, uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm Jeff Zundel. I'm uh, the inclusive design advocate in the design team at LinkedIn. And uh, that role is maybe a little bit of an odd title. It's kind of an, an unusual one. Uh, basically, my role is to be the internal subject matter expert on accessibility and inclusive design within the design team at LinkedIn and to develop a practice of inclusive design uh, across the entire org. Uh, so I do a lot of advocacy within the design team as well as with our immediate partners like engineering and product. Um, I develop training and, and knowledge resources, and then I also develop uh, like plugins and processes for our, our teams to use to, to kind of infuse uh, accessibility and inclusion into our practice. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us and for helping me co-moderate the discussion here. Um, you gave me the thought that maybe I didn't fully introduce myself, so I, I'll do a quick um, Brandon Middleton, um, one of the leads of this community college experiment that we're doing, uh, was born at Stanford University. Uh, by day, I work at Amazon Web Services on the startups teams. I work with uh, smaller companies trying to be bigger companies, and uh, some of them are actually doing some really cool stuff in the areas of accessibility, AI, ML, uh, and inclusion. So really excited to uh, co-moderate today. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Heather, feel free to take two or three minutes to introduce yourself to the people, um, you know, where you are, who you are, what you're up to, and then we'll do the same for Jamal after that. Happy to. Good afternoon or evening. I'm Heather Dowdy. I am a brown-skinned African-American woman. I'm wearing a dark purple dress uh, with a gold chain and some nice bright pink lipstick and makeup. I have uh, some long dark braids. I am the director of accessibility at Netflix and I work with teams to leverage technology to connect people with disabilities to their next favorite story. I love building community, but more importantly, I love building community solutions. Particularly, I have a background in accessibility and tech that spans 15 years across mobile, web, AI, and now TV. 
my passion really is connecting the dots across race, disability, tech, and faith. I'm very excited for today's conversation and to hear from a lot of you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Heather. And you're probably starting to hear in the language even if you're like just coming into accessibility and some of these topics, just the language that's used and the pace and the tone. So you're already dropping gems for us, Heather, just by kind of how you're how you're laying it down. So thank you for that. And I will hand the popcorn over to Jamal. Uh, feel free to yeah. take a couple minutes to introduce yourself. Yes, uh, and to that point of Heather dropping knowledge. So I'm Jamal Robinson. I'm still like kind of new to the space of accessibility. So the way that Heather introduced herself as I was like doing research for this talk, I did see where accessibility leaders would go through and describe themselves. So I'll do the same thing here. Uh, I'm five foot 11. I have like baby smooth brown skin. I'm an African-American male. Uh, I have like a six pack and a bulging chest from like working out. Um, I am actually don't have much hair on my head. Um, and I have a dress shirt on that's like gray <clears throat> with the collar. And my background is kind of all across technology. Uh, the last seven or eight years I've been focused on focusing on artificial intelligence and machine learning at companies like Amazon and Intel and IBM. And uh, my personal life, I'm a father, I'm a son, <clears throat> I'm a brother and I'm an uncle and a few other things. And I would say in this area, like I'm extremely interested, uh, probably my first uh, oriented accessibility was about letting certain groups of certain ethnic groups be accessible. Um, I'm sorry, gain access to certain environments. So like people that were kind of held away from jobs and people that didn't get the same opportunities in college as others might have, uh, was passionate about that. And then I feel like for me, at least uh, this is an extension of that making sure that everybody, uh, not just ethnic groups, but people with disabilities that are a subset of those groups also have accessibility. Um, yeah, and I'll stop there. Perfect. Well, I am, uh, again, very super excited to, to jump into some, some Q&A. Uh, Jeff and I will trade back and forth. Uh, Jeff, I'll give you the easy first question. You want to, uh, to kick us off and if we pose each question to one of our special guests and then the other one could totally like jump in if you have uh, an answer to it but we'll go back and forth back and forth absolutely i think that's great uh, this one's this one uh, definitely is the easy starter question uh, hopefully i guess it's gonna be a curveball uh, but no where were you where were you born where were you raised and uh and, and like what was that community like now uh, let's maybe start off with heather I'm surprised I didn't include it in my intro because it's so ingrained in who I am, but I am uh, born on the south side of Chicago, and I say south side with an emphasis, uh, given all that you might have seen on the media about the south side, uh, there is a, a lot to unpack there, but I am also a CODA, so child of deaf adults. Um, perhaps you've seen a recent Google commercial or the recent CODA film on Apple um, TV, I recommend and that you look into it. And I began signing sign language at uh, six months old. That's right, Chicago Sky, congrats. I began signing sign language um, at six months old. And so being the oldest, you uh, carry on a lot of responsibility, but I grew up in a household where we had a lot of technology that would help my parents and I and my siblings communicate with the rest of the world. There was a, a lamp that was um, attached to the doorbell when somebody rang and that lamp would flash, um, or my dad had a, a gigantic vibrator uh, underneath his mattress that served as his alarm to wake up for his night shift at the post office. Um, and then there were big bulky teletype writers uh, that uh, folks, people who were deaf and hard of hearing would type on to talk to other people or talk uh, to hearing people through an interpreter. And I was just really fascinated with wanting to be an inventor. Um, and so as I grew older, I started to dig in more and realized that that was an engineer. And that's pretty much what I uh, focused on and love again, uh, talking about. Yeah, that's, that's really, yeah, inspiring, honestly. <laughs> Brandon, what were you saying? No, I was going to just ask people in the chat to engage. Like if you've heard of or like had experience with any of the gadgets that Heather just mentioned, uh, feel free to throw a thumbs up in the chat. I'm just curious to see 
how many folks um, know about kind of this other side of technology that's used to assist people who are differently able. So I want to pass the same question over to Jamal. Um, but yeah, if, if you're in the chat, feel free to say, yep, I know exactly what she's talking about with the, 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 the lights with the doorbell or the vibrator under the mattress. Um, feel free to, to use that. But uh, yeah, Jamal, popcorn over to you. Cool, cool. And I have I put my thumbs up in the chat too. I've seen some of those things also. Um, so yeah, it's funny that you said this question is not a curveball, which it definitely shouldn't be. Uh, but for me, for like pretty long time, I didn't know where I was born. Uh, my life has been like kind of bouncing around a lot. I was born in Fort Stewart, uh, Georgia. I stayed there for about nine months, then went to Germany, lived across a number of like military bases in Germany, then went to Nuremberg and from Nuremberg, went to Clarksville, Tennessee, then Cookville, Tennessee, then Nashville, Tennessee, then Knoxville, Tennessee, then Houston, Austin, Dallas, San Francisco, now I'm back in Houston. Um, but as far as the community that I grew up in, um, my community was really excellent uh, as far as like diversity. And that could be ethnic diversity, but just diversity of people from all like walks of life and people with accessibility uh, needs and people without. And part of this was growing up on like a military base. Uh, a lot of the military bases for those of you who haven't been in the military or been on a base, but you have people that maybe pull somebody from, let's say, south side of Chicago or probably more realistically like middle of nowhere, Alabama who hasn't had like as much diversity and then you throw them in Singapore. And then from Singapore, they go to Taiwan and then from Taiwan, they go to Australia and they bounce around the world. So a lot of diverse perspectives. Um, as a black person, uh, specifically an African-American, I remember not knowing what, uh, similar to Sidney Poitier, if you read his autobiography, like I didn't have any recognition of like my race. And then fast forward coming to America, uh, it was pretty transparent that I was a black guy. And I remember like sitting down in the fourth grade trying to talk to my parents and understand like what race meant and so forth, um, because I was like challenged with that on a daily basis. So that was a pretty, yeah, pretty interesting contrast. And then also just the contrast of a European lifestyle versus a North American lifestyle. But that was my upbringing. And to um, have this point, like that definitely did shape me. Um, I think for all of us, like the upbringing that we have uh, definitely shapes us and shapes our perspectives. So I'll come yeah. back to you, Brendan. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, the second question that I have for, and I'll kick it to you, Heather, is you started to mention, you know, being fascinated with gadgets. Uh, but the question is, you know, how did you start to find yourself getting into this space of accessibility um, and kind of inclusive technology? Did you always know kind of from the little girl uh, assisting your parents with things that if this is what you wanted to be or was it a little bit more serendipitous uh, in the path that you've traveled has been a little bit more windy uh, than straight? Well if folks have seen my story online at all about my upbringing and journey in, into tech it really for me was just something that I thought was natural right like when you're surrounded with all of this tech you start to go like well, why does that work that way? But because I was in the position that I was in of the interpreter, not only for my family, but also for my community at church and other places, that was certainly um, to me seen as a responsibility. And so at first I thought I wanted to be a sign language interpreter because that was a very natural fit. And I remember having that conversation with my dad and he was like, no, that's, that's too easy for you. You're not gonna do that. And I'm like, what? Who wouldn't want their child to be a sign language interpreter? But I'm so glad, um, you know, as a parent that he saw in me that there was more and actually pushed me to dig a little bit deeper. And so uh, what's great is that you can still do a lot of things. I eventually um, ended up interpreting for President Obama at an event. And so I realized that dream right there and then and there. But really, it was looking at the needs of my community. Um, growing up on the south side of Chicago and seeing other Black deaf folks in our community let me in on a special, it gave me a special position. I like to tell people I'm a natural ally because I'm constantly observing, I'm constantly trying to bridge that gap. And more so with the addition of race and disability, I'm also looking for danger, quite honestly. I had a conversation in a group uh, text this week where folks that I've grown up with, right, for decades, 
I never shared the story of how my parents were like, we don't want you signing in public, nor do we really want you um, telling people at school that you have a deaf family. And you might think like, well, why were we ashamed? No, in Chicago, there were stories of people, deaf people that were shot um, because there were groups, gangs that thought that they were throwing up gang sign when they were signing. And so this is a very real reality that you're put in when you're able um, or you have the privilege to hear. Uh, so for me, I knew that I wanted to do something. I, I started with thinking it was an interpreter. Next, I thought it was going to be a civil rights lawyer. But I'm so glad that I uh, went down the path of technology because it really has been endless opportunities for me to get in and shape it. And so, you know, to close out, I started an internship at Motorola and remember saying to them, hey, looking at the guy doing disability access, like I could help you. And that's something I encourage all young people as they figure out what path they want to take is to really figure out where you fit in and start to craft that. And I've been really blessed that every particular company I've been at, I've been able to shape the role. Wow. Food for thought. Um, this is, this is blowing my mind. And I'm just, I'm the moderator and I've known you for a little while. So uh, Jamal, same question for you, man. Um, in terms of making space for yourself in the field of technology and then more specifically, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, probably not as diverse as we would hope it to be. So like, talk to us about kind of the start. Did you know as a little boy and then kind of the journey to where you are today? Was it, was it windy road or was it relatively straight? Sure. Um, definitely a windy road. Uh, I like, I love when I see people up and they give these talks and they're like, oh yeah, here's, I did this in life. I did that in life. And it's like this really smooth narrative. Cause I think that's probably not how it was. Like it's kind of, you retroactively go back and put amazing narrative to it, which I could do. But in reality, first half of my career, I was in oil and gas. And then after that, like I kind of made switch into Actually, before I even get into that, like I went to school um, to do computer engineering, uh, but I thought that was computer animated design at the time. Like I didn't even know the difference because uh, I came from communities where you didn't have as much exposure and then uh, to like advanced technologies. And then after I got into school uh, and realized I did the wrong thing, I'm like, oh, let me just stick with this. And it just so happened in society in large, like STEM degrees started to take off and you had the companies like Google paying people top dollar. And I call it a uh, little bit of the revenge of the nerds, uh, where nerds used to be like people you sit on the side. And now you have nerds, multi-billionaires leading these major companies. But um, going back to maybe some of the points that Heather brought up, um, and not directly to accessibility, but just seeing like needs in the community, um, seeing the struggles that other people have. Uh, I thought Heather's story was going to go a different angle when she was talking about signing in public. And I thought she was going to say like people would go and try to rob uh, these individuals because they thought that like there's less ability to have voice in the community and there's um <clears throat> i forgot who quoted this but it, it essentially says like those in society that have the least amount of representation are most likely to be taken advantage of so i would say like that theme i've seen throughout my career uh whether it's like accessibility needs or in the case of aiml uh your question about me being a person of color like in an organization that has 200 plus people and then looking around and only seeing like one or two people that look like myself. Um, even Brandon, when you first joined Amazon, you reached out. That was one of the comments you made. You're like, hey, I was looking through AIML and you're one of the few people that popped up that looked like me and we pondered on that. So um, things like that have motivated me as I think that I am relatively intelligent, but not, at, not any better than anybody else. And I wanted to make sure that I could pull up people that look like me. Because uh, as we go through this accessibility conversation, uh, me not being in Heather's position, having like deep knowledge in the space to where I can intimately impact it. I know that in the case of um, ethnic groups, we typically have the narrative of, well, give people access and like put them in the positions because those people can best represent uh, for their communities. And I think the same thing is true with accessibility in other areas. Like I know that there's a lot of things I don't know. Uh, but how can I enable and give people access to tools like artificial intelligence where they can go through and build applications for their community in ways that are most impactful for the communities, which um, I would have to be educated on, but definitely couldn't do from personal experience. 
Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to pass the, the popcorn virtually over, over to Jeff. Uh, feel free to take the next one. Uh, yeah, thanks, Brandon. And, you know, honestly, I, I'm going to echo what Brandon said a moment ago. Like, I, I'm, I'm like uh, having all these uh, today I learned moments <laughs> and, and just to kind of in awe here, hearing your stories and, and where you came from and how you kind of made these spaces for yourself. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to throw us another like kind of softball, so to speak, to kind of pull it back a little bit. Maybe see like if anybody else uh, listening in is is feeling that kind of awe, um, give us some common ground to like stand with you on. Uh, like what are some of the things that you like to do in your free time outside of work? What kind of things do you do, you do to hang out? Um, what do you like to eat? What kind of music do you think is hot? Um, what are your hobbies? Those kinds of things. This uh, is yeah. Heather. Heather, yeah. yes. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I forgot to say who. <laughs> no worries. I'm laughing at this because I feel like Brandon has asked me this before, and I'm like, oh, come on. I have three small kids. I'm trying to change the world. I don't know what hobbies I have. Um, but no, seriously, uh, family is in and faith is really big for me. Um, and so a lot of my time is really spent on the next generation. And that includes my kids, because I think it would be a shame for me to go and do all of this work and they not really know um, or be educated at, at how they can be advocates in this space. But um, I love to write. <laughs> yes, it's a very serious hobby. I love to write and um, having spent some a couple years in Seattle, I have become a nature person. Like I'm a big city girl, so for me to admit this, this is this is hardcore. But I love like taking nature walks and finding um, things for for my family to do outside. is just so grounding and refreshing. What about you, Jamal? Uh, uh, I'll echo that last sentiment of nature. So for me, for a different reason, because I have a ridiculous, ridiculous amount of allergies, like environmental food, like you name it. Uh, when I moved to San Francisco, Dolores Park, I was out there every Sunday. I would go to Kitchen Story. If y'all haven't been there and you're in San Francisco, definitely check it out for brunch. Um, but outside of that, <clears throat> um, interacting with family, like my parents are aging and they live in Houston. Uh, so like trying to interact with them and just, enjoying their time uh, while I have them available. And then in my personal life, I really just do whatever pops in my head. Uh, so sometimes you may see me DJing, I've like written books. Um, oh, and, and the question around music. So like my music is pretty diverse. Uh, lately I've been doing like more electronic and like Latinx and uh, definitely Afro pop, uh, but also um, not to stereotype myself, but I'm definitely into hip hop. I went to a concert a few weeks ago and obviously R&B too, so. Just enjoy things that are intellectually engaging, but then also things that can take me out of that intellectual space because sometimes I think too much. So I'm definitely down for the uh, mindless activities. See what decade of uh, R and B? Because it matters. <laughs> I, I, like, I feel like I feel like there's only one answer uh, to that. Come so on, it's, it's always '90s R and B, but I mean, all right. I do <laughs> get songs here and there from the current gen. Uh, because I'll say that the music now is more advanced. Like there's a lot more money going into the music, but definitely 90s R&B is always the foundation. I think from Heather's expression, that was probably the right answer. So uh, yeah. I wanna go over to, to Jan. I see a hand raised. Um, feel free to come off mute, Jan, if you got a question. Hey guys, um, thank you for your time. Uh, so living in DC, um, Gallaudet University is like, I think it's the only um, deaf and hard of hearing uh, university in, in the world that uses American Sign Language and um, English as the predominant language. And so, so many people here are deaf in, in DC and DC is not that big of a place. And I went to the Apple store over the weekend and I was just amazed at how a, the Apple has, I don't I, you're smiling Heather, I don't know, maybe you've seen this already, but I couldn't believe the person who was helping me, she came with the iPad and she had an interpreter and it's like it completely removed the bad, not saying that deafness is a, is a barrier, but I didn't even realize it. Like we're just all having a conversation and that Apple store gets crazy. And I could see that the um, deaf um, employees were signing across the room, which actually seemed to work better than anything else. 
how do you think like a place like, but that's Apple, it's a trillion dollar company that has lots of resources, but what they were doing, I'm, I could implement that myself for any company, right? So what, why have companies like, especially in a place like DC that has such a huge deaf population, I see them at Trader Joe's, people at Trader Joe's give me their phone and start typing. Why aren't companies making more of a concerted effort, especially in DC, which could lead the path in other countries, in other cities, why do you think that that's not happening? I hope that's not too convoluted, but I mean, I see it every single day and it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, this is how the, I love that example. There's also like a Starbucks store with all deaf employees and they're signing as well. Um, I love those examples because what you're talking about is true accessibility. And, you know, Jeff, you talked a little bit about how we've narrowed the definition, but when we think about the World Health Organization's definition, it, it disability is the mismatch in the environment against the person's ability, it has nothing to do with the person. So when we couldn't navigate that website earlier, that doesn't mean that you can't navigate that website. The website is inaccessible. And so when we can make the environment conducive to whatever the person needs and really empower everybody, oh my goodness, it's such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful picture. And so in terms of, of your question and, and thinking about why isn't why aren't more companies doing that? That's a really good question. I think that it really goes back to making sure that we have representation in our culture because we make the culture. Um, we being humans, being people, and how we view one another plays out in the business decisions that we make and the technology that we make. I like to say that tech is as biased as the people making it. So who do we have at the table making those decisions? Who do we have at the table that really is bringing in all of these different verse, um, diverse viewpoints on how to really enable? Sometimes folks and companies are thrown off thinking that there's a, a barrier in terms of cost when we really just need to think about uh, different ways in which we can do that, how to really be enabling. And especially given that this conversation is about AI um, and machine learning, it's possible. Mm -hmm. We're getting there, but it's going to take more and more people with disabilities at the table developing the technology. And it's going to take more of us and all of our spheres of influence to, to ask the question, why not? Mm -hmm. oh, and, and from my from my like limited exposure uh, compared to Heather, like two areas that I see also, uh, one being the education. Um, there was, as I was like prepping for this talk, there was a tech exec that was talking about they have like a disability center of excellence uh, where essentially people come in, they can learn like best practices and so forth. And he said that he created a course where uh, essentially everybody that started the company had to go through the program. And a lot of his product designers and people that were building products for essentially communities had no exposure. And he quantified that with like 10% of the people had exposure. I doubt most companies and most companies I've been at like don't have anything along those lines. And even the, um, like Heather's role, I don't know if a lot of companies have that kind of role in place. So just getting more education, which I'm assuming Apple like has some formal education internally. And the other thing I think is execution. Um, Heather has mentioned, I think the World Health Organization and I looked and saw where even the United Nations, um, they essentially had a kind of standards for a disability and suggestions on how we can best enable people worldwide. About a hundred, I think it was 177 countries like agreed that like, oh yes, we need to do this thing. But as far as execution and like putting the money behind it and making sure that there's prioritization, those things don't often happen. And some of it probably could be malicious. And then I think the other part is like, we're also talking about for-profit companies. And if we don't have like a top-down push, then more than likely they're gonna focus on what they consider to be the bottom line, or either focus on uh, who is in the room that's speaking, which I think Heather alluded to like representation. If you don't have the proper representation in that room, then those needs won't be prioritized. Yep. Yeah, there's an interesting um, kind of dynamic between capitalism and like social public benefit, you know, welfare for everybody and kind of the tension that we live in and the oxygen that we breathe in America kind of be in um, an interesting place where you see decisions that are made on both sides of that equation or that continuum basically 
uh, on a daily basis. So I'm hoping yeah. that everybody on the call here um, sees themselves as allies and like capable to be able to um, take these simple questions like why not? You know, where's the representation? Like there, this, is, this doesn't take a rocket scientist to uh, advocate. So hopefully these kinds of conversations are the kinds that um, give you the confidence to be able to speak up in your organization to uh, know enough about maybe a differently able community to, to poke holes in uh, product or feature set or strategy. So that's, that's the whole intent. If you walk away educated uh, and empowered to be able to do something like that, then I will uh, think that all of us here on the, the panel will be super proud. So yeah. yeah and uh, if I could even yeah. respond to your point on like the capitalism versus like, do we serve this community? Um, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, they were asking them that question also. It's like, well, hey, how do you prioritize this? Because he has the chief accessibility officer. And from his perspective, it's like, hey, like it's not one or the other. Uh, essentially enabling people with accessibility needs, there's a billion people worldwide. So if you want to look at it from a consumerist perspective, then this is a large market that is underserved that you can tap into. So hopefully more companies will take that perspective. And then also hopefully these uh, numbers will be out there because <clears throat> focusing on like the ethnic or focusing on African-Americans uh, specifically, you also get that narrative too, where it's like, oh, not a lot of black people out there and not a lot of black people educated and we can't do this and that or focusing on diversity is not worth our time or it's too hard and we have to invest more money where statistics show like having more diverse communities uh, from an ethnic and disability perspective, like puts that company in the best position financially to make that for profit that they're organized around. So hopefully we can have a cultural change too, where people start to think um, diversity first across accessibility and so forth um, versus capitalism first and so on. Yeah, yeah. So Jeff, I know we've been uh, talking a little bit, but I know that you're kind of a subject matter expert in this space, if you have thoughts that you wanted to share. And then I also see uh, Pia came in with the question. So uh, after Jeff's comments, maybe Pia, you can come off mute and, and ask your question. Yeah, well, I I love everything that, uh, that Heather and Jamal have said already. I, I think these are really salient points. Uh, one of the things that I think is, um, is, is, I have to remind myself of this, is that a lot of disability is invisible um, and it carries a lot of stigma. Um, and so when we think about representation, um, if, if a billion people worldwide are disabled, we know that underemployment is, uh, is, is much higher among people with disabilities. Um, but you likely have coworkers, you likely have friends, uh, uh, maybe even family members who have a disability, who experience that disability on a regular basis, but don't talk about it. Um, and they, or they don't want you to talk about it. And, and that makes it invisible. And so with, without uh, part of being a, an ally um, is creating that space for that, that, that happen and maybe normalizing it, not forcing that person to identify their, or, you know, out their disability, but creating more of a normalization. Um, and, and that extends to other aspects of human identity too. I think if you look at the participant list and the people in this call, um, me and, and uh, a few other folks in the call might have pronouns listed. Um, I have he, him on my, my pronouns. This is something that helps normalize. Uh, like I, I'm, I'm listing he, him on my pronouns. I look masculine. I, I have I, I kind of my pronouns might match what society might consider to be normal. But I do that not because I feel like I need to clarify that for people, but to help normalize the user pronouns. And I think the same thing needs to happen with disability, that uh, we need to help normalize that so that there, there isn't that, that stigma. People don't feel like they have to carry around some uh, disability in, in an invisible way. Yeah, I plus one that, and I think a practical thing uh, that I've done just right on my laptop, if you were to look down and you're in this office with me, a small like sticky note, a little post-it that I got right here um, brings to my kind of remembrance on a really regular basis because I've got meetings on this thing all the time. Some of these uh, tips and tricks to help it be normalized and to help feel help people feel more included. So um, if you've got to get, you know, very first grade with it and make yourself little quick post-it notes or sticky notes and just put them in places that you're at all the time, uh, I think it'll take very practical, easy things like that in order to uh, help us to get to where we're trying to get to. Um, but yeah, definitely I appreciate those those comments, Jeff. And um, 
can I, um, I know I'm not supposed to be asking questions, but maybe a question for Jeff and uh, Heather. So uh, as I was going through this journey and like making sure I could do justice to uh, uh, this conversation and doing the research, I started to think about myself with all the stuff I've seen online. Um, I have contact in now, but without my contacts, like Brandon would look like Jeff, Jeff might look like Heather, Heather looks like me. Like if I'm more than a few feet away, it's very difficult for me to see. Uh, if I'm honest, like my hearing is not what it used to be. So just thinking about the number uh, with the billion, which I think I looked in the chat, and Jeff, you're saying like it's even more. Um, do you think the average person knows that they have disabilities? Like I think in some more obvious situations, like it'll be pretty clear, but do you think part of the problem is there may be people, let's say like me, until you have certain exposures, <clears throat> you don't realize like you're in one of these communities also. Or, and then the follow up to that is um, when I was thinking about this and how I could be more empathetic, I thought about like I mentioned having uh, aging parents. And a lot of times as you age, the functionality that you have like slowly starts to degrade. Um, so is that a way, is that a path forward for us to be more empathetic because we're all gonna age at some point or we all have aging parents uh, that are losing their abilities. Or not saying we all have aging parents, but theoretically we'd all have people in our lives that are aging and we can see that they're losing their abilities. So I'm just wondering, is that a path forward for the average person to like be more empathetic through that lens uh, if they don't have somebody that they know of that has a disability? Uh, I think those are both really great questions. And Heather, I, I can tee it up. I, I'm, I'll, I'll uh, toss it over to you if you don't mind. The, the, uh, Heather mentioned something earlier that I think kind of gets into this, and, and it's the, the WHO definition of disability, um, which is this mismatch between the features of a person's body and the environment in which they live. Um, and and uh, some people experience that mismatch a lot more commonly because of the way that we've designed our society. Um, most of the environment that we live in is a designed environment at this point. Most of us don't live in nature uh, in, in a very pure sort of sense. Um, but uh, that, uh, that means that like, a lot of people experience disability on a very regular basis, even if you don't identify as being disabled. Um, you might consider that your temporary situation or te temporary or situational disability um, where uh, like a situational disability would be like you're in a, a, a loud bar or a, a busy airport and so you just can't hear the, what's going on on the TV. Um, and you might rely on assistive technology to kind of help uh, perceive the stuff, that, the content that's coming out of that TV, like the closed captions, for instance. Um, you're not, you wouldn't identify as being deaf necessarily, but you're experiencing uh, an effective disability the same in that situation, the same as somebody who might be permanently deaf experiences the disability perhaps all the time. Um, so I think that there's, there's that aspect that I'd encourage people to kind of try to identify a little bit with, more with, that um, disability doesn't, it doesn't always have to be confined to just this, this permanent box. And if we think about it as this more uh, temporary and situational disability as well, we might have an easier time identifying with it personally. Um, you, and, and then help it, that, that can help uh, normalize things a little bit more. Anyway, without rambling too much further, Heather, <laughs> what else do you have to say? No, I, I love it. Um, I don't have to be the only one to say all this. So I'm like, keep going, Jeff, keep going. Um, yeah, all of those things. I would also add to the conversation uh, again about what we see representation and having a culture that makes people comfortable to self-ID, uh, which Jeff, you know, I used to work at Microsoft and so worked with LinkedIn and, and, and the efforts that you all are doing there. That is so important. Um, when looking at some of those websites earlier, if that was a website to apply for a job, have we made it really clear how a person can request accommodations? Or do I have to go through the email um, walk of shame of figuring out how to contact somebody and being handed off to another person just to get bigger font size or whatever I need. Um, so having a culture that makes it makes it so that people are comfortable self-IDing is really important. And I see in the chats, like how do we do that within companies? Um, you know, some of the other companies, including Microsoft and, and having folks talk about it at the top have been 
that's been really powerful. Having leaders uh, disclose whether or not they have a disability has also been really, really powerful um, in itself. And, you know, Jeff talked about essentially the spectrum, but we like to say in the disability community, this is the one community you can join at any time in your life. <laughs> Yeah. anytime and that's not meant to scare you and if it does again think about like representation and and all of those things that i brought up but anytime in your life you know jamal you brought up aging like we are a tech savvy generation do you really want to wait until you're a mature adult um for us to say hey this technology wasn't designed for you no. really at that point i won't have any representation probably as an older person in the tech industry to get it to be designed for me. Well, we can start now, you know? And so I'm also seeing in the chat, cause like my mind is like buzzing. Uh, someone said, hey, let's this Trader Joe's situation. Uh, how do we make it easier? So a person doesn't have to, you know, uh, flip out their phone and take notes. All of these are like great ideas that start with people talking about it, raising awareness, and then to start with people pointing out best practices and, and what we can do. Yeah. So I'd love to um, maybe extend this point to some of the technologies that are making it easier. Uh, for accessibility to happen. Uh, maybe I'll start the question with you, Jamal, and then kind of expand it to, to you, Heather and Jeff. But like, what are some of the things that you point to on a regular basis that have uh, given you hope to say, hey, we started with nothing. And now the technology that we've built and created is providing a pathway for kind of ease of access for this uh, community that's been historically kind of stepped over or held underneath? Like, what are some things maybe in your world, Jamal, that you are especially proud of when it comes to uh, the accomplishments of what we've been doing in AI and ML? Sure, and the hope will have a slight asterisk on it uh, because as Heather mentioned, the technology is only as good as the people. So we have to make sure we have the right people in there making it accessible and we're not doing it just to monetize. But um, there's some examples. Uh, we have people working at Microsoft, so I use them as an example, but like seeing AI, uh, was an application that was developed. Uh, it was pretty cool because they, <clears throat> part of like Satya, the CEO of Microsoft's um, thought process was if you have a large company, then you have the all, you have all the R&D that you need for uh, disabilities and accessibility, because essentially your employees represent that community. So how can you bring them together in a meaningful way and then let them impact um, not just the company, but impact other lives. So they had a hackathon. They built this application called Seeing.ai. Uh, from my understanding, uh, there was another application that was available, but people had to pay and they made this free. And this application basically pulled technologies like computer vision, which is a way uh, in artificial intelligence to essentially scan an image and let AI have an eye and essentially see what's in the image and like provide labels. And then that can be <clears throat> used with um, text -to speech where you can essentially hold a camera and prescribe the world for a person with low vision or a person that's blind. Um, so I like the fact that one, companies are allowing their employees to make those investments and pull things like that together. And then we're also making that technology available. Uh, they have a few commercials out there with uh, multiple people that are blind that are using the app and get the world described to them. And, and to be clear here too, it's, it's not just artificial intelligence. Uh, there are other technologies that are being stacked together. Uh, so when I first saw seeing AI about four years ago, uh, it was purely about like AI, but then mixing that in with like lighter technologies uh, which allows you to have depth. A uh, gentleman was speaking about like being in line and being blind. And he's like, oh, it's great to use an app and have like various things uh, <clears throat> told to me. But my issue is when I'm standing in line and it's a long line, I need to know when the line moves. And that lighter giving you the depth perception lets you know like, okay, this person's six foot away and now the person's eight feet away. And you can kind of logically uh, discern like, okay, the line's moving and the person doesn't have to ask or constantly like try to move around. Um, there's a few other things, uh, just picking some of the tech majors, not saying that this is exclusive to them, but I think these are household names. Uh, so Google uh, has done a significant amount of work in this space. I listened to their machine translation team uh, give a talk on like machine learning, and they have a few projects that I'll highlight. So one project was called Shua, um, which I do not speak uh, 
actually I've not been to Japan, but I don't speak Japanese, but it's supposed to mean uh, sign language in Japanese. Uh, so this is essentially a computer vision data set with over 150 uh, sign languages used globally, which was something that I didn't know. Uh, like being an American seeing sign language, I thought that was a universal thing, not realizing there was different ones. So uh, to be more concise is to say that we have the application level where we're pushing out applications people can go and consume. Uh, they don't have to build anything from scratch. But I'm also seeing companies provide the entire stack for artificial intelligence, meaning the data sets that are needed. Um, I believe Heather was mentioning earlier about her father having a bed that vibrated. There was a uh, data scientist at Google who had went through a scenario of like a fire alarm going off and because he can't hear it, his neighbors had to come in and knock. So Google gathered together 600 the sound events. So it can be a fire alarm, an alarm clock, a baby crying and so forth. And they made that data set publicly available for other people to be able to consume also <clears throat> and build these applications. And then outside of just the technology, um, there's also like the funding and how do you go out and enable people, which maybe they have the tech, but they don't have the resources. And Microsoft also has like AI for accessibility program that goes out and funds people that are doing really creative and cool things around education and uh, making work more accessible and so forth. So seeing these things, and then also, as I mentioned before, seeing a company like Microsoft setting the tone as they're a trillion plus dollar company, and they're like, hey, we're gonna have a chief accessibility officer. And uh, from my understanding, the lady was already working at the company, but she was elevated. And as Santi was talking, he said, I need to have an executive like that in all of my meetings to make sure that she's informing how we go about products, how we go about software. And then not just seeing that, um, let's say at a Wall Street level and he's given talks and like trying to check boxes. But uh, if you all looked at the most recent Surface Book announcement, which is Microsoft Laptop, they had a special session where they sat down and talked about like how they made the computer more accessible. And they had like a dedicated accessibility kit that would help people that had um, difficulties with like typing on traditional keyboards or even holding the laptop. So these are the things that are giving me hope. Um, I think that we definitely have a lot more to do, but it seems like we're trending in the right direction and trying to make technology and environments inclusive for all. Yeah, Heather, I'll, I'll put that same question to you. Uh, I know Jamal just gave us a bunch of um, uh, stories and points and different things that uh, we've done already, but especially when it comes to like Netflix and like media and entertainment, uh, I don't often think about accessibility outside of captions for like what I'm watching. So I don't know if you've got any uh, additional stories or things that have given you hope for the work that you're doing on a daily basis uh, to add to that, that particular question. I have to have hope, right? Like you have to have progress. This is, this is a battle. This is a fight for disability justice. Um, so, but I love how Jamal just routed off all the things I used to say uh, coming from Microsoft. I helped build the AI for accessibility program, but um, yeah, I, a couple things. Captioning is, is so huge and uh, what we've been able to do at Netflix with, with captioning and subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing and just subtitles period. When you think about it, the there are lots of people that turn on uh, subtitles and, and captions when watching Netflix and they don't necessarily identify as having a disability. That again translates to usability and whatever situation you might find yourself in. Perhaps you're holding a child that's crying at night and you still want to watch squid games or whatever the case may be you can do so with captions and i love um our approach to really uh what we like to say in the accessibility industry is is solving for one and extending to many the rest of us can reap the benefits of captions but i'll also say that there are um, other things in terms that we're doing in driving the conversation if you haven't checked out um I love that. If you haven't checked out Crip Camp on Netflix documentary talking about the disability rights movement and the history of it, I highly recommend that you do. It was such um, a stellar point, well done, and such a, an important moment um, in in our history uh, to be able to see that on screen and to be able to share that with the world. There was some great things that we were able to do around that partnership, including um, descriptive transcripts uh, for people who are uh, 
deaf and blind. So things like that, again, just expand what we can do to really connect the world to their next story. And so I, I love that. And in speaking about the world, I think that stories do educate. And so uh, one of the things that I love as an example for what we could do with AI and machine learning is a project um, that I've worked with the team in the past, not necessarily at Netflix, but just in terms of using um, cognitive services with AI to help blind students in countries like India and Kenya be able to take their exam, their university exam, test more independently. Imagine showing up to take this very important exam that you have studied for forever, almost it feels like for, and the test taker, the human test taker that's there to help you uh, read the test to you um, is a ninth grader that knows nothing about STEM and doesn't wanna sit there for three hours while you take your exam. Um, it's empowering that the folks that enable and iSTEM have created a digital assistant that empowers blind students to be able to do so more independently. And so it's, it's stories like that, uh, whether that's through technology or whether it's on the screen, like with Crip Camp, that I love because it really opens our eyes to, wow, that's a need. And that is something that we are able to close the gap with using accessibility and technology, but more importantly, we are seeing and hearing um, and sitting with one another's experiences. Love that. Um, wow, I feel like we could talk for five hours and I know folks don't have five hours on this topic, but um, just before we even get to the very end of this, I mean, big kudos and thank you to, uh, to Heather and to Jamal and Jeff for helping to lead this conversation. Uh, again, I'm going to virtually toss the popcorn back over to you, Jeff, for the next question, but um, sincere gratitude and thanks for um, just enlightening and kind of illuminating us with, with your perspectives. Uh, yeah, no, I think uh, we just talked about what's happening in technology and what, we're, what, what you're excited to see kind of coming out of technology uh, in this space. What about with regard to like policy and regulation and what's happening maybe beyond the technology and, and in society more broadly? Um, what's happening in that space right now that you're excited about or maybe uh, anxious about uh, perhaps? Uh, what are some of these concepts that, that we should be aware of uh, and topics that are, that are happening in the regulation and policy space that are gonna be relevant here? Uh, Jamal, you want to? Yeah, definitely, definitely, Heather first. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm I'm thinking of how to be concise um, because ethical considerations are really important when we're designing um, AI solutions. And an example that we tend to give in the industry to drive it home, I gave it to my Netflix colleagues the other day and like, they just got quiet. I was like, oh, that's not how I wanted to introduce myself, but I just believe in making things real. And so without ethical considerations, you know, when we think back to self-driving cars and a couple years ago, when we were just trying out those algorithms, uh, the there um, was definitely testing done where the algorithm wouldn't recognize the behavior of a person in a wheelchair in a crosswalk. And so typically if you're in a crosswalk, you might back up your wheelchair a little bit before you go over the curb. And in those early algorithm testing um, tests, that algorithm would, would have the car run over the person. <laughs> Uh, is, is not funny, but have the algorithm run over the person in the wheelchair in the crosswalk because we don't have enough inclusive data sets. AI and machine learning particularly runs on data, runs on data. And the conversations that are beginning to have, and Jamal, you talked about, you know, companies sharing more broadly and making it open source and open data sets. That is such an important conversation that we have to have at all levels. And quite honestly, think about the framework in which we're building AI and machine learning, um, not necessarily because policy requires us to do so, but because without it, we could actually do harm. 
And so it, it just really is important for us when collecting data that we have more of it. Number one, we talked about sign language recognition before, and Jamal mentioned over 150 uh, different sign languages globally. We didn't even bring in, you know, the different dialects. You know, in America alone, there's Black Sign Language, um, and that is different from ASL. And so I won't get into that, but but having these communities and empowering them to collect their own data so that we can then train models to more accurately recognize sign language is an area of exploration um, and all the other ways that we can have more inclusive data sets. Like when we think about voice assistance and speech recognition, um, there are black individuals living with cerebral palsy that use uh, augmentative and alternative communication devices to supplement uh, speaking and writing, yet don't have the option to choose a Black voice. It's 2021, why not? Mm. But these are the types of things that we need to think about in terms of giving, in terms of personalization trends that we're looking at for AI and machine learning, but also the flexibility that all of us need. And just to, I uh, won't be as elegant as Heather on this as I'm not uh, as well versed in this space, but uh, one thing to clarify uh, what Heather said so nobody's uh, overly traumatized, that example that she gave with the driving, that was a simulation. Uh, people weren't like driving and actually hitting people in the wheelchairs, which, yeah. But uh, the point that I think uh, underscores there is kind of aligned with how I think about policy. Like we need to make sure more people are included in the conversation because uh, I can just say the people that I work with that wouldn't be something that they would think about, uh, wheelchairs or canes or things along those lines. So making sure that we have proper representation. Um, and also I think making sure we have proper exposure because uh, it's probably not gonna be realistic to get proper representation everywhere. But if I have had intimate exposure to communities that have needs, then I can go and make sure that those communities are represented. Um, so from a policy perspective with AIML, um, and this is kind of like a problem that, um, crosses a lot of different areas. But right now it's very wild, wild west with data. People can take data, there's no data regulation. Models come out, they're essentially a black box. Nobody knows what's being, uh, what's happening and what decisions are being made and what's being prioritized and people aren't focusing on these things. So ideally if the government can step in and just make sure like we clearly understand uh, how data is being collected, what data is being collected. Um, and then also like for models to be produced that we understand like what, um, I'm trying to think of a non-technical way to say this. So in artificial intelligence, there's various features that people train on. Um, so what features are being elevated? So if you're making decisions, are you prioritizing people without accessibility needs in the model because there's more representation in that data set? Making sure like there's a good understanding of things like that. Um, I think Heather also hit on this too, but um, this is something that benefits everyone. Uh, I mentioned Google and Microsoft, but we can't have two companies or even five companies controlling this. I think that if we have public policy around areas that are generally uh, helping most of society, like maybe having some kind of public data set, which I know we have uh, data.gov, but uh, <laughs> it could be better. Um, so if we could like uh, get data from like these private companies, I think that'll help a lot. And then uh, maybe the last thing, which I kind of said this earlier, but just making sure that we are bringing people in with accessibility needs. Uh, for example, when I was in elementary school, um, we had this program where we would, at the time I didn't know what was going on, but like once a week we would go down the hallway, there was like the special area. And then we were going in with kids that had various disabilities and we would just sit down and read books with them. And what that did for me was kind of normalize uh, people with physical disabilities and so forth, where as a very young kid, you're used, to, you're used to seeing people with or without accessibility needs, but if there's any difference in the clothes or the glasses or anything like that, you want to tease them or um, say mean things or whatever. So like just having that exposure, I think can build empathy. And for me, like the foundation of all these policies uh, needs to be empathy uh, because we can put a policy in place and we've seen this, but nobody will execute on it. Or it'll be something that makes sense on paper, but in execution doesn't help and we're not really going through uh, the weeds with the policy to make sure that we can help others. Um, so I think if we can have empathy across all these areas and I think eventually we can get to the right place with the policies with people like Jeff and Heather and even Brandon out there. Um, I think we have the intelligence, we just need to bring the right people to the table, give them leadership positions and 
uh, make it happen. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I just said, I, I, I love that. <laughs> yeah, fascinating, like, on-ramp for me, and I want to do this kind of round-robin lightning round with all of us um, in the chat. If you've ever had a resource, you know, we mentioned Crip Camp, for example, that has opened your eyes and illuminated uh, kind of your, your mind to what was out there that you had no idea about. Um, my contribution will be a book called Far From the Tree. Uh, this guy named Andrew Solomon wrote it and got a bunch of awards for it, but he documented a number of the lived experiences of people who live these differently abled lives. So I was under, I was able to understand, for example, uh, the life of um, a little person or a life of somebody who walks around visually impaired or blind, or even stuff like um, folks with PTSD and trauma that's been um, the result of something like TBI, traumatic brain injury. So uh, in the chat, uh, if you wouldn't mind, if there's been a resource just in the terms of doing this as a community, a book, a podcast, or something that you've uh, listened to, seen that has been helpful, uh, we'll be able to capture it and send it back out. But then for our special guests here, I'm going to go Heather, uh, Jamal, and Jeff, uh, feel free to share you know, one that you uh, would call out to the community that you might have recently consumed or has been like seminal in helping you understand and do the work that you do. So uh, pass the popcorn over to Heather. I know you called out Crip Camp, but we're going to make you do double double time for this for this one. I know. I'm like, how many gems, Brandon, you want me to drop here? These folks are going to be like, write this down. Um, you know what? This is not what you asked, but I'm going to give it anyway, because this, this just really impressed upon me. You know, Netflix has a series, Strong Black Lead, and there was a girl, Charmaine, on there talking about Black uh, ASL. And I just highly recommend people check it out. Um, she even recently was on a Gap commercial. So just talking about, again, influencers and thinking of that differently. That just really impressed me in terms of the younger generation and how we can be inclusive. Um, let's move down to Jamal. Anything interesting uh, from an AI and ML perspective, accessibility perspective, inclusion perspective that you would call out for the group? Um, I mean, nothing comes top of mind, but I think like the things that I mentioned here, uh, for me, like getting educated in this space is like just going everywhere because I, I don't know if there's one place that the narrative exists. Um, so some of it can be in the physical world, meaning like going out in communities and volunteering your time or energy and working with people with accessibility needs, and then just understanding like what their walk of life looks like. Um, there's also documentaries out there um, and books and so forth. So I would just say like engaging in as many of these spaces as possible. There's also people like mentioning like being on Twitter and Instagram, which seem to be like primary news sources now, but just making sure that the voice and needs are heard, uh, whatever that medium is, um, let's say consume, like based off of what you learn best from, which for some people's Twitter and Instagram, for me, it probably it's books and documentaries or physically meeting people. Perfect. Uh, let's pop corner over to Jeff. What you got? Uh, I think I think there's so many to choose from, um, kind of echoing what Jamal just said. And uh, I think being inquisitive is, is huge and uh, doesn't matter what states you're in, this cuts across everything. So if you're, if you're using a piece of software or website, if you're uh, going out in the world physically and looking at like, how are sidewalks designed? How is that building design that you're about to go into? Be, be inquisitive about that and think like, how, how would I open this if I, if I couldn't use my arms right now? Or how would I, how would I, how would I open this door? Or like, how would I get up this, uh, this building if I couldn't see. Um, I think just having that inquisitive mindset is good to like kind of train yourself to just think and be curious. Um, but one of the people I've been following recently that's kind of just been uh, blowing my mind left and right is uh, a woman named Meryl Evans, who is, um, she's deaf. She's been deaf since birth, I think, is, uh, is I believe. She's not um, deaf with a capital D, and she kind of taught me this, that there's not, there's a difference between being deaf and being in the deaf community, and she's not really part of that deaf community. She doesn't know sign language. She, she reads lips, and that's how she understands what, what people are saying to her, um, 
and then she talks and she's kind of learned how to talk and so that really uh, she's constantly dropping gems on uh, social media at least on linkedin where I, where I tend to spend a lot of time but i think she's on twitter as well um and uh i'd recommend you know find those people who are telling their story and who, ha who have uh, put themselves out there um because there's a lot to learn just by listening i'd imagine some of those people are jeff and heather also if you just follow <laughs> them yeah. i mean I've, I've learned so much so they're also thought leaders in the space too yeah well that's beautiful i know that we are like one minute to the bottom of the hour and like i said before we could probably talk about we hardly scratched the surface of like deaf culture and the deaf community. This, this might be something where we have to like pull the group together and get like a part two on the books. But um, let me just move forward one slide and like really land on a thank you for uh, Heather and Jamal and Jeff for making their time um, available and for being accessible to us. And then to each of you in the community that's out there that have asked questions that have um, dropped in resources that you found helpful. Uh, when, once the recording for this is like processed, uh, I will ask for homework that you find somebody maybe in the course of your work life or the course of, you know, your family or community life that might also, you know, have their mind blown with, you know, some of what we've talked about or just maybe the on ramp to them learning something about this space is you sharing kind of this talk with them. So. Uh, it will be open. We are, you know, recording it so that we can um, kind of spread this message out because I, I do think that we walk by each other and don't acknowledge the, the disabilities that exist. And we also don't have a good framework or format to be able to kind of spread the love uh, for, for lack of a better term. So um, I'm going to go off of sharing here and just um, ask people to throw some snaps and some claps into uh, the chat. Go ahead and go to your reactions really fast for me and give some hearts and some uh, claps to our special guests and to, to yourselves for, for participating in this conversation today. And um, yeah, I maybe pass it around. Just I don't know how to give a heart, so I'll, just, I'll do this on that. <laughs> I'm not a Zoom expert. Yeah, what I'm going to do is uh, just give it to each one of our special guests one more time to maybe just one minute um, to say any last words that you might have. If anybody wants to uh, say, if you leave with nothing else besides this thing, insert your 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 awesome quote. So I'll start with Heather. Um, if you want to close it out, I'll go to Jamal and then Jeff, and then we'll uh, we'll get out of here for the night. Absolutely. One thing that you can do is be inclusive on social media. That's where a lot of us engage. So uh, caption your images, add, add closed captioning to the videos that you make. That's important. And as change makers, involve the disability community throughout the development process, not just at the end, but throughout from design to execution and to testing um, is really important. And uh, lastly, we've already said it, but get to know, I, get to know the disability community, widen your network afraid to ask because you mentor a youth uh, with a disability. Um, there's something that we can all do. Mm, beautiful. Jamal, what you got? I had a quote I was going to steal, but I don't think I wrote it correctly. But uh, Judy Brewer said, digital accessibility in a modern digital age allows us to capture the greatest contribution from everyone. So I do think that's the promise of technology. Uh, Jeff was kind of alluding to this earlier, like we can make life easier for a lot of people. So as Heather said, like get deeply engaged in these communities. Um, you have to be that light that you want to shine on the world. So try to do that yourself. Like when you're posting, it may seem like something small, but you can set off a catalyst for like a larger change, especially on social media, which essentially trends happen all the time. So definitely jump into that, but then also get out there, get engaged, um, challenge those around you and just make sure that everybody's being more inclusive for the whole of society. Excellent. Thanks, Jamal. I'll pass it over to you, Jeff. What you got? Oh man, parting parting thoughts here. This is this is a this is a hard question. I, no, I think uh, echoing what Heather and Jamal have already said. Um, see what you can do to create that space for people with disabilities to be in the same space as you are. Uh, you know, if you're 
if you're working in tech or you're in a university or you're doing whatever, you 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 may have uh, you may be in a position of privilege and in a position of power to create space for somebody else who maybe doesn't have that seat at the table already. And it could be something really subtle, um, or maybe they have a seat at the table but they don't have a sense of belonging. Um, and so uh, it, it could be something really subtle, like uh, um, maybe. Uh, recognizing that that everybody works a different way, we're, we're in stressful times right now. Um, if you're in a Zoom call or a video call of any kind, uh, you're doing the applause. You saw maybe Heather and I when we were doing our applause. Maybe we did this applause, um, but you can do this too. This is how you you do applause for in like American Sign Language. So applause, and um, that might that might make somebody who is uh, deaf or hard of hearing um, feel more of a sense of belonging in your Zoom calls. And just little things like that. What can you do to, to be an ally and to help create that space? Um, because downstream, I think that if we create that space, we'll have more representation at the table with us um, when we're creating the environment that we live in, when we're creating the world that we live in, and that will lead to the world we want. Beautiful. Well, um, I guess I can't do it better than any of those three, um, but what I will do is uh, just a quick preview of next week. Uh, I didn't do this last week, but uh, these will be our special guests next week. We're going to pivot to like arts and culture. So we're going to have a cool discussion with Estelle. So if you know her from the American Boy song uh, with Mr. West and then uh, Anytan, he's an author of a bunch of multi award winning books. Um, yeah, feel free to come through for next week and have uh, a good discussion on LCD, which is love, which they're both big on. They have a, a show called Love on Wednesdays on Apple Music. Uh, C is culture and D is design. So uh, with that, we will uh, sign off for this evening. But again, on behalf of the whole community college project and family, a uh, big thank you to Heather, big thank you to Jamal, and a big thank you to Jeff and everybody who joined today. Uh, we'll sign off and uh, wishing everybody a great rest of the week and hopefully we'll catch you next Tuesday. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.